What is up, guys, and welcome back to the Sweat It Out podcast. Today we have a special guest, all the way from the Big Apple. That's right, guys, New York City. This guy, what up? he is a tremendous person. First of all, I got to give him uh, my, my hat off to because he is, first of all, a tremendous family man, father, and then from there he moves on to being a tremendous businessman. He's an entrepreneur, the founder of HPL Training, HPLT Training, two-time Men's Health Mag cover, this guy, he is going to crush a 50-mile run December 12th. He just finished a 40, and I can't wait to see it. Guys, please help us welcome the one and only Brian Mazza. What's up, bro? What's up, guys? <laughs> How you guys doing? Doing, doing well, man. man. Doing really well. How are you? Good, 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 good. Just um, focus on this big run December 12th. Um, you know, doing everything possible to give myself the best chance of, of really excelling during this run and taking recovery very seriously. And um, fortunate that I'm able to really help and give back and help these families uh, through their IVF process and everything. So it's, it's a, it's a wild time, as we all know that we're all going through this crazy pandemic. Um, but, you know, life does go on and, and we have to, we have to keep moving forward and keep helping people as much as we can. So um, I'm in a really good place. Thank God. Let's, uh, let's kind of talk about that a little bit. I'd like to hear more about, cause you mentioned it, you know, before we started the podcast about, you know, this incredible amount of money that you were able to raise, uh, for this tremendous cause. So why don't we kind of tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, why you're going on this run and, and what you were able to do for all these families. Sure. So, um, I, I'm, um, I started a fund with Cornell, um, with wild Cornell and the fund was to, help facilitate and raise funds for people to have their IVF um, fertility treatments paid for. Um, my wife and I conceived both of our children through IVF. So I felt like it was the right time and place for me to give back um, to families in need that can conceive naturally and also don't have the, the funds or the healthcare provider that allows them to uh, have this taken care of. You know, it's around twenty-five to thirty thousand per child, um, and it's not a guaranteed process. So just think about not being able to conceive naturally, paying a ton of money to attempt to have a child, and that might not work. Um, so you know, over the years, my wife has been a huge advocate um, and, and is a very, very prominent person in the IVF community, and uh, I just felt like it was my time to give back and run 50 miles, um, basically raising a thousand dollars per mile, which we'll hopefully get to. And, um, you know, it's also a personal thing for me too, to see how far I could push my body and my mind and see what I'm really made of as an athlete, um, and give it my all. So, you know, we should hit 50,000 by the time the, sh the gun goes off for me to run. And, um, I couldn't be happier where I am physically and mentally right now. It's a lot of miles, a lot of hours, a lot of lonely trail, just going on the pavement every day. Um, but you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about what you want. It's a very emotional roller coaster. Um, a lot of good days, a lot of bad days, a lot of good times during the run, a lot of bad times during the run. It's very emotional. It brings, it's very therapeutic in a way too. It brings back memories of a kid. It, like I just posted a a video today on Instagram of me when I tore my Achilles and that process was, was really detrimental to my life and depression and it was very hard. Um, so you, you, you go in deep into the crates of your life on these runs. Um, it's almost like you're tripping in a way. Um, it's really wild. Well, I got to give it off to you, man, because you, it's, it, first of all, it's really unique to see, you know, the cause that you're doing this behind because, you know, you, we, t we hear the typicals, you know, cause of the, you know, fight for breast cancer and these other ones. And I think it's really unique, the one that you've set up because it's something that you don't see as often um, being raised money for and stuff like that. And I think it is an important thing. And if there is somebody that can go out there and do that and hit those 50 mile runs, personally that I know, it would be you. You know, and um, I think it's really amazing to, to see that journey of yours, even from the startup pandemic of how you've done things, um, how have you gone through, you know, through your journey, what you continue to do and fight for. And I think it's one of the most inspiring pages and, uh, um, you know, you being one of the most inspiring people to follow um, along on their journey. So I definitely got to give you my hats off to that again and say that it's really tremendous. And definitely we would love to support you along the way as much as we can possible. 
thank you. You know, like nobody really talks about male factor infertility and no one, you know, I was the main cause of why we weren't able to conceive naturally. Um, I had low sperm count. And, you know, you think at, at this time when you're trying to have a kid, like it's the next progression of your life, the next progression of your relationship. Um, and, you know, I was fit. I was making tons of money in our restaurants. Uh, everything was great. Uh, everything couldn't be better. And then I'm like failing at this and it's a big ego, you know, crusher. It's like, yeah, you can't get your wife pregnant and it's, you know, you're letting your partner down. A lot of resentment starts to happen, unfortunately. And that's just, you know, human nature. And, you know, it was really rough for, on our relationship. I didn't know if we were going to make it. I didn't know how far we could take this and continue to keep failing at trying to conceive naturally and everything. You know, it's, 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 it, it was on me. So it, I took it really personal and I was like, fuck, you know, I'm letting my wife down and it was really hard. And I didn't really want to talk about it with people because I felt very insecure and I felt like a punk about it because as a guy, you want to be that alpha man, right? In your family and you want to like, you want to get your wife pregnant. Uh, and I couldn't do that. So, you know, I'm, I, you know, someone actually, I, really funny today, I was doing something for a brand I work with and they were just talking about like, what, if someone went on your page, what would you want to tell them that they wouldn't be able to figure out? And it's a really good question for you guys on podcast too, to ask people. And, and I really just thought about it. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I have the same insecurities as a lot of people. I have a lot of the same issues that a lot of people have. Um, you might not always see it. And I feel like a lot of these influencers, a lot of these people who are in our space constantly don't show these sides of their, their issues. Right. And I feel like it's my duty as someone who is more vocal about it now to just let people know like male factor infertility is a problem. If you do have it, there are options. If you do have this problem, there are solutions that um, can help you and you can talk about it. You're not less of a man to discuss it. Yeah, I think it is truly important, you know, especially for people like us who do have platforms that people look to for inspiration to be able to open up and and really, you know, show a little bit about, you know, what's going on inside of our personal lives and, and why we go through similar things that they go through or different things that they go through that might, you know, the, the thoughts in our heads and the way that we work through it still apply to them in, in their own lives. So, you know, it's always great to hear from, from especially male uh, athletes within the fitness industry or male coaches in the fitness in industry who are willing to open up like that. You know, we talk about it all the time about, you know, how much of an open book we want to be with people because that really is how people are going to learn from you, right? They're not going to necessarily learn from these like very cookie cutter um, displays of physical, you know, uh, athleticism necessarily, but more often than not, like what are the things that we do day to day that really make a difference in our life over the long haul? Yeah. It's, it's really important, especially um, for us as being men to really be vulnerable and talk about a lot of the issues that sometimes we don't talk about it. Um, it it's just, it's cool to talk about it. It's cool to be vulnerable. We're not all, you know, tough people. You don't have, it doesn't make you tough when you don't talk about these things. Um, it actually builds up and actually makes things a lot more difficult. So I encourage guys who have issues that want to talk about things that can help other people. The amount of messages I'm getting is, is pretty overwhelming, actually, to be honest with you, about how many people are going through this, how many people have been through it, how many people are actually suicidal from it, which is like even, even crazier to me. So the fact that we are reaching the masses on this um, and, the, some, and a lot of these people do have these issues and they're, they're able now to talk to me about it or just a lot of them say, don't even respond to me. I just have to like get this off my chest and just tell you what I went through, which is crazy. And, you know, I, I, I respect what they want me to say and, and, and do. And, you know, I, I might write back and just say, you got it. Like, you know, you, you'll, you'll get through it. No. And I think it's really amazing. The fact that, you know, you opening yourself up like that and, and allowing these people to come in and talk to you, you know, really gives them, you know, a, a sense of like some kind of relief because it's like, man, you know, again, we're not the only one, you know, there's all these other people that are going through this. And it makes you realize at the same time, like, hey, there's something, there's something bigger at, at stake right here where most people don't even hear about this, think about this, or let alone there's not many causes about it of trying to raise awareness for it. And I think the fact that you're doing that is really, 
um, setting the light bulb up for, for, for some huge impact um, in a lot of uh, couples um, and couples and, and married couples lives to really, you know, move forward into moving forward into, you know, conceiving. Yeah. You know, I also, uh, another reason why we're doing this is I, I want guys who are in their late twenties or in their twenties and, and early thirties to go get checked. Mm -hmm. um, you might not have this issue and that's great, but you might have this issue and it might be something that you can get ahead of it. Um, maybe through some medicine or, or doing something therapeutic that can help your cause um, when it's that time for you to take that next step in your life, rather than being with someone maybe for a long time and then attempting to have a child and then figuring out that you do have some sort of problem, then you're already behind the eight ball. So I just want the awareness to be brought to it. I want to destigmatize the issue on it. I want people to, to just know more um, about it. And if, if I'm the guy to start that trend, then so be it. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I did want to ask you if you don't mind diving a little deeper into it. You know, for you personally, you know, when you found out about this, you know, what was what was the biggest things you had to do to be able to handle yourself and, and go through this this time period of, like you said, you know, dealing with the ego and the masculinity of like, man, I can't do this. And man, it's my fault. Like, what were some of the biggest things that you had to do um, to be able to get over that time? And did you have help from anybody else? Do you recommend other men to go receive help and go talk to somebody, especially during these times? Yeah, you know, to be honest, I had no help um, with this process. I had no one to talk to. Um, I didn't talk to my friends about it because I was embarrassed. I didn't talk to my parents about it. Um, then my parents didn't even know we conceived um, through IVF until we told them. Um, so I didn't have any help. And it, it didn't help that my wife was going through it also in the sense of me letting her down. It, it caused a big issue for us. Um, so I was on I was on the island solo, just trying to figure it out. And you know, fitness was a huge part for me to release um, and, and use that as a consistent force and in, in trying to bring some normalcy to my life at the time. But for a really long time, um, I would just look like blank into the sky and just be like, I don't even know what the fuck am I going to do? Am I, we, is this relationship going to last? Or are we going to get divorced? Or are we, should, you know, I don't want to let her down. I want her to have kids. So maybe she needs to be with someone else. Um, once this option came to the table, you know, we were really happy because we found an amazing doctor. And um, again, this is not a guaranteed thing. This is something that could work or could not work. So you have to kind of do your research and figure out, is this the step you guys want to take as, as, a, as a family? I have a, a two part question. One, I want people to be able to know where they can one seek help you know, if they, if they are kind of going through this, this, uh, this issue, as well as, you know, what, what did you partner with a specific organization? And if so, like, where can people go to donate to, to that organization for, for the, right. Work? Yeah. So, you know, you can, wherever you live, I'm sure there's, there's fertility clinics, um, or hospitals that specialize in this in, in certain cities and major cities, probably a lot easier, but just do your, your basic research, then you'll be able to find some doctors. And, you know, if, if you're if you are with um, somebody and they you could probably talk to their OBGYN and they could probably sort that out for you too and, and recommend some people. But um, so we we partner with Wild Cornell, the Ronald O. Perlman and Claudia Cohen Center for Reproduction in the city. Um, an amazing, amazing institution. Uh, I can send you guys the link after this so that That'd be amazing. You know, be great. People could donate, which is really you know great, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I, I felt like that was the best opportunity rather than me just like creating a GoFundMe page and um, just getting all the funds and, and then sending it to somewhere. I felt like it was very, very important. And I didn't want to do this unless I could partner with them. Um, that's where we conceived our kids. And that's where, where, that's where I'm actually starting to run in the city. Um, but I felt like a, such a powerhouse institution um, like them would really allow us to be more credible, will allow us to raise more capital, um, will give us the infrastructure as, I don't want this to just be a one-off. I'm not saying I'm gonna run 50 miles every year, but I don't want this to be a, just a one-off run. I want this to be something that can happen every year. We can continue to raise funds. We can continue to raise awareness on it. And something that is like really prominent and in, in, in especially the, the male population mind 
that this is something that we need to get checked out and I want to run and raise money for, because I feel like if you ask anyone, someone knows someone who went through this at some capacity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 100%. Yeah. I know so, quite a few people. Yeah. Right. And, but like the conversation with men usually would go like this, like if we were on the podcast and we were just like kicking it like homies, you would say, yo, like, are you guys having kids yet? And I'd be like, nah, man, we're just trying, yo, did, did the heat win last night? Right. That would be the conversation. It would go like that quick. Mm. But when, when women usually talk about it, they get more in, in detail and they talk about the struggles a bit more because it seems like it's okay to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying we need to all sit around and hold hands and say kumbaya and talk about our fertility issues. No, but we could just be more comfortable about what is going on. Mm-hmm. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. And I, I don't remember where I saw it. I think somewhere, you know, on some random Facebook video, but uh, some radio DJ was talking about, you know, how they had had trouble with, uh, you know, having and having kids and getting pregnant and, you know, how uncomfortable it was when every time, I mean, I used to be married. I mean, you're married, you know, you have a girlfriend. How many times have you been told like, you know, Oh, when are you guys having kids? When are you guys having kids? Like, Oh, you guys are married now. When are you having, you know, like it's, it's, it can be, it has to be such an uncomfortable conversation. It was so bad. Like, Oh my God, every time. And then like, then you see some, maybe some of your friends like having kids right away and then you're, you're very happy for them, but it hurts you because you're like, fuck dude, like it's not working for us. So it, it's, it's not fun, Yeah, but you're right. It, it's a very uncomfortable process. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, a you know, a, a good thing to continue to acknowledge and understand that you never really know what someone's going through. Right. So even something as simple as like, you know, and you, you asking the question might not even realize that it, you know, it's such a big deal to them. Yeah. You know, you're just thinking like, Oh, you're, you're married now. So when are you having kids? It's like, that could completely derail the person for the day or the week or the month. So you have to be really yeah. cognizant of like what you're saying and who you're saying it to. Cause you never know what someone's going through at any certain point in time. So what, what, have you come, what have you come to learn from this is speaking with doctors and, you know, creating this awareness. Is this more something that is just developed out of nowhere genetically? Um, how does this happen? You know, is there exact evidence on, on, on that? Or is it just, you know, when, like I said, one of these things that can just appear out of nowhere. It could just appear out of nowhere. It could be um, certain things maybe in your diet. It could be some, certain things that happened to you over the years. There's so many different, there's a list of different things that could be, that could go on. Um, we didn't really know what the reason was for me. Um, there was never like, you did this because of that. Now this is the cause. Um, you know, it's, they always asked me because I was always in relatively good shape. Do you take steroids? They always asked me that. That question was like the number one question. Do you take steroids? And I'd be like, no. Um, and you know, they do blood work, so you can't even lie. So they'll, yeah. they'll, they could tell if you're like taking tests or taking a D ball or Winnie and all this crap. Right. Because then therefore that could be an issue of why this is happening. But no, they, there was really no direct correlation of doing something that was this result. I, I want to kind of dive into something that you mentioned a little earlier. You, you mentioned that, you know, diving really deep back into your training routine was something that you found a lot of comfort in and that was very beneficial for you. What, what experience was, was that or how was that experience like for you? And like, why were you able to find solace in your training routine? I mean, we talked we talk about all the time like, to each other about how good we feel after we're able to get, you know, quality workouts in consistently. And I'd like to hear from you or, and I'm sure our audience would as well as like, you know, what that experience was like for you and, and what it really meant to you. Yeah. You know, fitness has always been a major part of my life. Um, and when I say fitness, I just mean like playing sports and playing a very, very high level in soccer and college soccer. And um, that is always something I've been very comfortable in, so when I always tend to like when times are getting really tough and maybe in my personal life or business or whatever, I always tend to dive back into more fitness type of adventures because I know that it'll get me through what I'm definitely battling and, and fighting. So fitness for me is something, it's just an outlet. It's just something that keeps me in check. Um, it keeps me and makes me know that I'm alive. It, it allows me to, um, just feel that passion and that burn of, of accomplishing something. Um, like right now, as I'm training for this run, like the amount of hours I'm putting into this um, is pretty ridiculous. And 
you really start to learn a lot about yourself. And it was great to jump back into this right now because I'm feeling like I hate to just train with no purpose. And I think that sometimes for people is where they get burnt out and sometimes where they are not being successful at what they want to do or transform their body mentally or physically, whatever it may be. There needs to be some sort of thoughtfulness and process to why are you doing a certain thing? Now that could be as simple as I just like to sweat because it makes me feel good. It could be like I'm training because I want to lose weight or I want to put on muscle. That's my purpose. And that's why I'm doing it. So like for me right now, it was great to like have a task at hand, have a goal that I wanted to achieve, work with my coach again and get back into being like an athlete, a real athlete and, and taking a stab at something. Um, there was never no doubt in my mind that I wasn't going to be able to do this. Was I scared of it? Sure. I was a little like shook, but like, that also gets the juices going and that gets like the, the, do I have butterflies right now in my stomach about next week? Yeah, I do. It's going to be fucking crazy. But like that brings me back to being a kid again when I was strapping up my boots before a huge NCAA, you know, tournament game. So I'm getting all of these feels again that I once had and it's fucking awesome. Like when I, I don't just go run. I prepare for my run. I dialed in for my run. I'm eating properly for my run. My headphones have to be perfect. My, my, my sneakers have to be perfect. Like I'm treating it like it's fucking game day every single day. And I think once people start to do that in their, in their regular life, if they're not training for a race, but if they are training for something in their life and if you treat it like a fucking game day every day, your outcome will be successful. And I think when I was going through all this infertility crap, I had a purpose that I needed this outlet to give it my all and bust my ass every single day training because it made me feel alive again and it made me have purpose. So that's what I think a lot of people don't do and, and not just in fitness, right? Like fitness is great, but there's so many other benefits from doing fitness in your personal life, in your career, and in, in your just mental clarity that means a lot more than being able to go run 50 miles or running a really fast 40 or deadlifting this or you know, all these people do these crazy things on Instagram, like backflips and all this crazy stuff. It's all great, but like, there's so much more to it. Um, and that's, and that's why I do it. Well, I'm going to tell you off the bat that one of the biggest things that stands out here, which you see lacking in, in most people, even the ones that are working out or say they're working out is the intention behind it. And I think that one of the biggest problems is exactly that people are not being intentional with whatever they're doing, you know, their fitness, their, their, their relationships, their business. And that's why they're not seeing success on either, on either of those platforms uh, because they're not being intentional and not giving it 110% when the time is being for that specific task being. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people fall off and they're like, man, it, it's drags on, it's too hard or man, it's taking forever. You know, and I think if you're intentional at that moment with whatever you're doing, you're going to get the best out of it. You're going to feel the best. And you're going to see that it's actually not as time consuming because if you do it right there and then, you don't have to make up time for that. You don't have to go again and have a, another extra workout or have to take extra homework from your, from your job. Or, you know, now you have to set up uh, another day to spend with your significant other because you guys weren't really paying, you weren't really paying attention to her. You were working while you were, you know, spending time with her. And I think that if we led our life with intentions on all levels, I think we can definitely see a lot more success driving through. Um, I want to ask you, um, because you did also bring up the fact about you having a coach. And one of the biggest things that me, Josh, Josh and I talk about all the time is coaches need coaches. Um, and athletes need coaches all the time. And, you know, if you want to keep winning, you got to make sure you have somebody on your side that can help you to continue that growth. Um, I would definitely love to talk about some of how, some of the routines, some of the stuff that you and your coach do together to be able to get you ready for, for these races, for these competitions, for everything yeah. that you're doing. Well, you know, like once someone starts thinking they don't need to be coached or they don't need a coach is when they're not going to continue to grow and they're just going to stay stagnant. And that, that's ego, right? That's whatever. I pride, myself on, I pride myself on not being the best in anything. And, and I say that because I like to surround myself with people that do it better than me, that have done it if I haven't done it. Um, like when I train, you, know, you trained with us, but you know, I mean, Rob is one of my dearest friends and like Rob Pinnell could arguably be one of the best lacrosse players to ever play the game, but you've trained with him before, right? Like he's a mm -hmm. fucking animal 
and what he does is everything is with intention with him. So there's no, there's no doubt that I've become a better person and become a better athlete because I've surrounded myself with Rob. Like that is just true, right? So it's, there's, I went out and got one of the best coaches that is in, in this space right now, in the tri space and, and biking, running, swimming. I'm just running right now. But, you know, dialing in with him has just given me such a better sense of comfort and, and confidence um, because he's just so much better at this than I am. So I'm learning. I want to learn. I'm an, I annoy him all the time. I text him all the time. But I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, and, and you need someone to keep you in check and you need someone to d- explain things to you and give you homework. And I don't ever want to say like, I've done it. I don't need to, to practice more or do this and that. Like, that's just whack. That's just not, not I want to be a journeyman. I want to continue to learn and, and do these things because it keeps you young also, right? And, you know, I have kids, I have two boys. So I want them to see me continuing to learn. And I want them to see me um, with the adversity and grinding it out and putting in the work like, you know, now my, my three and a half year old's like, he's understanding what I'm doing a little bit, not to the full extent, but he, I see him doing a little push-ups when I'm doing push-ups. Let's go. That's amazing. That's awesome. I talked to him about burpees and he hates burpees and all these things, right? Like, so he sees it. And when I'm in the gym, he comes in and I want to work out with you. Not that he's working out, but it'll click that he saw me doing this. Right. And it might click when he's 40, I don't know, or when he's 21 or whatever he's doing. And that's the intention, right? It's, it's leading by example. And I always want to lead by example by continuing to learn and continuing to put myself in a position to grow. And that's the beauty of life. And I, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've gotten a few questions before from people who have asked me like, oh, well, what's the best part about being a coach? And your explanation is always what I give them. It's like when I train my clients and I see their kids come out, and start doing push-ups and start saying like, oh, I want you to look at my, you know, look at what I can do. It's such a good feeling, you know, because not only are you able to help, you know, the person that you're working with, but you can really see the trickle down and how like their daily actions are affecting these little ones. It's, it's amazing to see. And not only that, like how much these kids are actually like absorbing and how much they really are paying attention. You know, it's remarkable. And, uh, you know, from someone who who didn't have their father in their life, it's it's you know it it really is such a such a great thing to hear you know you really you know take the step that you need to take and, and be the father figure that you need you know you need to be for your kids. It's 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 a great yeah, thing to hear. It's really important, and for me, you know, being a father is the number one job I'll, I'll I'll ever have, and you know I take really great pride in that. I take great pride in setting them up, up for success. I take pride in teaching them lessons when he might do something that is wrong or might do something that he shouldn't be doing instead of just yelling at him. It's explaining, talking to him like an adult, um, showing him love, but showing him you can't do certain things like that. It's not how you should act and it's not how you should be still taking into consideration. He's three and a half years old. Um, But that's what I want to do with my life. That is, I don't want to be an absentee dad. I don't want to be someone who's just working all the time and not being home. I want to make a lot of money and do it the way I want to do it. So um, it, it's just, it's, this whole process has been just phenomenal being a parent. And there's so many ups and downs, but at the end of the day, there's nothing better. I got to agree 100%. It's like, you know, even kind of what we talked about before the podcast, you know, asking about each other's families. And it's like the more and more I see my little one, you know, growing up and she's going to be two now, it's just, you know, mind boggling to think that it was just the other day and, you know, seeing the mannerisms and, you know, the things that she's learning and, you know, obviously the good, the, the you know, telling, you know, re- reprimand them in a healthy way when they're not supposed to do things and then the way they react and all that. It's, it's amazing um, to see how they duplicate and how they take information and then how they do certain things depending on how we're doing it. And I think it is so true. You have to be an example every single time, especially as a parent first before anything else, you know, if you're going to lead, lead as a parent, especially if if you have kids, uh, because that's going to show you how you're going to lead everybody else, you know, and I think that at the end of the day, when you have that effect on your children, you see it pour out into the world later on when they're older, you know, from, from the way that they act with their own health, you know, if they go into business, uh, the way they are with people and friends and and other family members. And I think that is one of the most important things. And we do need more of that, um, setting the right example, you know, moving forward into the world. Agreed. So with that being said, I I would love to go into 
this time period that we're in during COVID. And I would love to ask you, what are some of the biggest things that stuck out to you? Um, you know, being an entrepreneur, being a businessman, a father, an athlete, but now being, now being at home, I'm sure pretty more often and spending time with your family more and your kids, how has that shifted from, you know, before COVID and the way that you look at things now moving forward? Sure. So, you know, I, I was in the hospitality space for 15 years and I recently left that space about two and a half years ago and then created a new company called High Performance Lifestyle Training, which you know about. Mm -hmm. um, and we were crushing it and doing really, really well. And then actually this past December, we had a really bad house fire here. We lost our home. Um, so we were displaced in January. Um, and that was when we were planning our HPLT event in LA with the Navy SEALs and everybody there. Um, yeah, so that was an epic event. So like, you know, as much as the house fire occurred and we lost our home, everyone was fine. So like right when everyone, I knew everyone was fine. It's like, this, these are just materialistic things. We can rebuild, we can rebuy, we can move on. We have great insurance. Let's just keep it moving. And that was my take from day one. Um, you know, obviously there was some emotion tied to it, but I was like, we have to keep it moving. We have to continue to grow. I have a business I need to run. I have a family I need to run. Um, and my wife needs to get back and work. My wife's a journalist at CNN. So right then and there, like before the pandemic happened, we were punched in the, in the face 10 times. So when the, when the pandemic started to happen, Luckily, I was able to get my first event in 2020 done, um, which was great. And then we were supposed to have our one year anniversary in May. That obviously didn't happen. So HPLT inherently had to go on hold because um, we couldn't have in-person events. Um, so that taught me, A, you need to have money for a rainy day, right? That's really important as a, a parent and someone, uh, you never know what's going to happen. Um, but I was really prepared because I was like, there's nothing worse than losing your home. So this is going to be really bad right now. Let's really be safe, but let's double down on ourselves and let's try to really improve personally. And that's what I really did. So that's when I really started to up my mileage in running. That's when I started to lift two a days and get very strong and work on my savage. Is, what is that? I said savage. Yeah. You know, like I, I was like, okay, this is an opportunity now that I know I always trained really hard, but now I can really dial in, created a home gym, um, started doing all these, these workouts and just becoming better. Um, and to be honest with you, I loved being at home with these kids. And the first part of Leo's life, I was running multiple restaurants. So I didn't really get to see him at night. I only saw him in the morning. So now that we have two boys, I really saw Luke, from day one grow. And it, that was the really special part for me is that I was able to really see every moment of him um, and go through all the ups and downs of that. So that was beautiful. You know, it's hard too, because my wife needs to film. She's on TV every day. So we're in a rental home. We, she's filming in the basement. It doesn't look good. We're trying to make it look nice for her. So now that we're finally back in our home, I'm like, you guys can see me. I'm filming in her studio. We created a studio for her now so she can film. Yeah, it looks great. For CNN. Thanks. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of stress. And I always say this to like, to people who, you know, sometimes to my parents or people question, like, there's so many things going on in our lives as parents. Like, it's not just, we just come home now and I'm working out and running and my wife is just writing an article. Like there's a lot of layers to this relationship and a lot of, if you peel back the onion, there's so many things going on that it, it does become stressful. And whoever says that it's not stressful during COVID that they're back with 24 seven with their partner and with their family, they're lying to you. Um, there's days where it sucks and there's days where it's great. And you just gotta, I'm gonna keep it real with you. That's just really how it is. Um, but you learn a lot about yourself. You, you learn a lot about your partner, right? <laughs> you, 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 you figure these That's things right. out. Um, but this is, you know, hopefully this never happens again to us, right? As Yeah, fingers crossed. Hopefully we can sort this stuff out sooner than later and everyone be a little bit more smarter. Um, and hopefully it's just a once in a lifetime event that was really long and we can get through it and we can just look back and say, wow, it was a really shitty time. But I did these five things that made me better for the future. And that's what no one is talking about. Everyone is talking about how shitty 2020 is. And yes, it is shitty. Guess what? My business shut down too. My business was this. And all these people are just constantly complaining. I get it. I get it. I get it. 
but what are you doing now yep. to prevent something like this maybe from happening in the future? And what are you doing now that's going to make you better? Fuck the pandemic. All right, it's here. What are you doing now to become better? This is the time to work on it. Exactly. And if you're not working on it, when the pandemic is over, you are just so far behind. Yeah, there's something about that keep it, move it mentality, right? That really builds resiliency and breeds success. And, you know, what do you think about, you know, people who think, because it, it seems to be across the board, everyone who's just like, you know what, fuck it, whatever, whatever situation comes my way, whatever fires I have to put out, I'll just deal with them when they come. But I got to, I got to keep moving my feet. I got to keep. I'm, I'm like that. I'm like that so much. And my wife kind of hates that a little bit about me because I'm very like, I, I don't show a lot of emotion with it. I'm just like, I process it. I'm, I look at it. I see it in my head. I'm like, okay, how are we going to get through it? And that's, that has always worked for me. Sometimes that doesn't work for people. Some people like to vent and sulk about it and that's fine. And then eventually get through it. But like when that fire happened that next morning, I already hired a crew. They already started demoing. We were already looking at houses, we kept it moving. Like you have to That's go. what you got to do like, though. You know, that's you what you have to do it. Yep. Cause if you don't do it, you're going to be stagnant. You're going to stay still. People are going to keep it moving around you and you're just going to be stuck. That's right. So with the adversity stuff, like when I tore my Achilles a week before my first son was born and I'm like, that was the biggest moment of my life that I was anticipating, right? Having my first boy. And literally you have, I had this vision of me, like when my wife was going into labor, me like flying into the city (laughs) hospital with the wheelchair being like the hero. No, bro. She wheeled me into the fucking hospital and she was having contractions because I couldn't walk because I just had surgery. And my foot was up. So talk about like getting your balls chopped off and like you're done. <laughs> that was me, dude. Yeah. So like, but I had to keep it moving. As, as depressed as I was, I still went to the gym. I was ski erging in a chair, dude. I was rowing That's with cool. my foot up. Love it. Fucking push-ups with one leg up, dude. Like 500,000 push-ups a day. Like I just did it because I knew that this tough time wasn't going to last and the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Even when you lose a house, bro, your sun is going to, the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Hopefully, God bless everyone. Everyone's going to be okay. And I knew everyone was fine. Like, the sun is up. Let's fucking go. We can be pissed. Of course, we can be upset. 100%. We're human. But we got to get the new rental house. We got to get the insurance team going. We got to get the third party adjuster on board so we get the most money out of the insurance. We got to rock and roll. We have an event to plan in February for HBO TLA. That has to be the fucking baddest event ever. We got to go. No one's going to fucking feel bad or, or stop. They're going to send you a text. Yo, dude, I hope you're good. If you need me, text me. But that's it. You got to go. You said it, man. Spot on, dude. Like, when you can when you can react during moments like that, the way you reacted and not allow things to phase you, you know, like you said, you can't stop. You know, and it's like I say pretty frequently, you know, the world doesn't stop for you, so why are you going to stop for the world? And you got to keep moving no matter what. And I think that just more people need to hear that consistently because it is true, you know, during the pandemic, during other certain life crises, a lot of people stop and then they stop and they keep stopping and waiting or kind of waiting for something to fall in their lap and it's not going to happen. It's not, you know, and I think that if more people understood that and realized that, and obviously granted, everybody is different. Everybody reacts differently. Like you said, some people, yes, they need to vent out. And I get that as well, you know, and if, but if you are going to vent out, take your time to vent out. But also to understand that the venting can't be take can't take too long. Where now it sink, it sinks you into a deeper hole. Take your time, vent, and let's keep moving and let's start winning. And I think that that attitude is going to be truly, truly amazing to to approach. You know the way that we we are moving forward. You know through this pandemic, getting out of it and after. And I think it goes to to one of the things that you say all the time that this, your, your your famous statement: if if not if nothing changes, right? Never nothing changes. It won't it won't change. How does it go? You 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 tell the fans out here. Yeah, nothing changes. Yep. That's it. It's one of my favorites, man. It's one of my favorites. It, it's it's a great saying, and it's it, you know I really attribute again fitness to to having this mentality, right? Because. It's the consistent hard work. Like right now, like the runs I have, right? I, last week I had, um, fucking was wild. I had a 10 mile, I had a four mile, I had a 20 mile, I had a four mile, I had a 18 and I had a 40. Like Ooh. back, back, just death. 
but it's the work. It's the grind. It's going out every single day when you don't want to go out. It's going out every single day when it's cold and raining. You guys don't have cold because you're in fucking Florida. <laughs> it was but cold. It cold. was cold the other day. It was like, it was like yeah, 64. It was, like it was 64. <laughs> I was wearing two crew neck sweatshirts and like the heaviest sweatpants I had outside. Exactly. Right. It's the times you don't want to go out. It's just doing it. It's the grind, the hard workouts that make you want to throw up sometimes, the hard workouts that, that take so much. But that builds the backbone and the foundation and the tough skin. So then when tough times do happen, I always say like some of my workouts with Rob are way harder than dealing with the fire, <laughs> you know? And it's crazy to even, but perception is reality with that stuff. Like it's, it's just how it is. And I attribute a fitness to a lot of the success that I'm able to fight through these problems. I want to dive into, I want to, I want to ask you a question about HPLT. You know, what, what exactly is your, your high performing, uh, high performance living, uh, sorry, lifestyle training uh, system and, and what makes it so new, uh, unique and so impactful in, in so many people's lives? So I, I believe, um, and a lot of people don't believe this, but I believe everyone is a high performer. But in life, sometimes it doesn't click for everybody. And it's just the process of understanding your worth, understanding your ability as a person. Now, there's a lot of factors that go into it, life experiences, growing up a certain way, whatever. But you can't teach everybody the same way, right? Like some athletes need to be coddled. Some athletes need to be yelled at. Some athletes need to, to be spoken to a certain way. So when I created high performance lifestyle training, I wanted to go out and get the best people in the world to show us how they perform at such a high level and what works for them. And in doing so, I knew that through the mind and body philosophy and, and going through all this stuff, that the people that would come to my event would leave with the certain tools and sharpen their tools if they already were at a certain level or if they didn't know they were at a certain level, become better no matter what. It had nothing to do with me. It would just be me setting them up in certain situations that they would be surrounded with the David Goggins, they'd be surrounded with the Matt Frazier, a, a Mike O'Hearn, the Navy SEAL team, that they would, be ex they would be experiencing and seeing how certain people operate. And that's how, what I really wanted to do. That was it. Then it blew up where we had so many people coming and going to seeing these seminars and speaking in engagements and having a roster of 40 people and, and doing these weekends where now they become best friends. Now they're investing in each other's businesses. Now, now they're just sticking with each other and doing all of these things because the camaraderie was created and that team environment was created, which I didn't, I'd be lying if I was sitting here and lying to you if I thought that was how it was going to happen. But it started turning into like we were a team and then that team grew and then we were doing other events and workouts and everything. So I can't wait till we get back to that. But the motto I have is that I, I think everyone's a high performer and I like to get people in these uncomfortable situations and bring out the best of them. That sometimes starts with the worst of them, but ultimately by the end of the 72 hour weekend, they have improved so much and to get the confidence that they know they can become a better parent, better mom, better dad, better boyfriend, better girlfriend, better in business and just a better all human being. Amen to that, man. Amen to that. And I want to ask you from, from your events that you put together, what was the most impactful moment out of all the events that you saw happen in front of you or that you experienced? Um, would definitely love to dive into that a little bit and, and share how that impacted your life. I mean, there's so many to, you know, having a 60 year old woman do her first, uh, sprint triathlon in Miami Oof. and her being like, I never fucking swam or rode a bike like this before. Like that was wild and seeing the emotional toll or running six miles with David Goggins on the West side highway, like, wow. and seeing people just seeing our group, just look at this man, like, Hey, he's a God because he's such a savage and, and everyone just getting so motivated to work, work hard or, or dealing with the Navy SEALs and, and the Marines during this training session in LA and, us being in the water and drinking the water and spitting into a bucket and, and people being so shocked that they have to do this, but really loved it and enjoyed it. And were like blown away that they, this is what they were doing. Um, or just having like, you know, talking to Patrick Schwarzenegger and seeing how he is investing in what he's doing as such a young entrepreneur and professional and 
and giving the people that are coming to HBLT who are young hope that they can invest in companies if they save and do the right things. Or having, you know, Mike O'Hearn on stage, arguably the best the Titan. ever. The Ooh. Titan. Um, and just talking to him about what works and what doesn't work and, and how he is able to stay like this at such a, a, a later into his career and everything. So it's just the education process of it and, and educating the brain and callousing the brain to, to know you can fucking do anything. And, and I love, like, people cry at the end of the event when they have to say goodbye to each other. It's crazy. And that's 72 hours of someone who doesn't even know each other. So it's working. So we better get back to it soon because I need it. I need it. I need it. So when are we expecting the, the next one to be? I know, I know it's kind of hard to say with the pandemic, but when, when would you like to expect the next one to be? You know, I was having a lot of hope that we were able to do one this November, but it just didn't work out with all the spikes happening and everything. So I don't know, maybe the spring. I, I'm, I'm hopeful for the spring. I think we might do it in New York just to keep it simple and smaller. But, you know, we signed a big deal with Vital Proteins. They're a huge partner of ours now. And um, we're contracted to do a bunch of events with them. So we might be down in Miami sooner than later to do one. So that might you be really definitely cool. Definitely let us know whether it's in Miami, New York, we will be Yeah, there. for sure. Speaking of speaking yeah. of Vital Proteins, I heard you did a, or I saw you did a shoot with our boy, Matt Roy, when you were down yeah. here not too long ago. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. Yeah, that's that a really cool fun. dude. Very cool. Um, we did that with Cindy Prado. That was super fun also. And mm. we shot that um, for the, the new performance stuff and everything and did a bunch of beach work. And that was, that was fun. Yeah, Matt's a funny guy. He's, uh, he's hilarious. Yeah, he's the one that shoots all of our content yeah, for us as all well. All the time. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, known Matt, I've known Matt quite a long time already. He used to train at one of the, one of the private facilities that I used to train at on South Beach. Yeah, great guy. Great, great photographer, guy. too. Amazing. Yep. So on top of everything that you're doing, what's what's the next big thing for you besides the 50-mile run? Because I know that's huge. Yeah, I have to, <laughs> I have to get through that. <laughs> what's next? I don't know. Right. CrossFit Open, maybe? He's one of the biggest achievers I know. I know. You probably no, can do I'm anything. I'm sure he has something lined up next. <laughs> you know, I, I'm happy that I'm able to, to do this, right? So I'm pumped that I'm able to do it, and hopefully I can do it really well. I don't know. I'm not going to train like this like, forever. Um, I don't think it'd be smart, you know, running this much, you know, I ran 275 miles this past, past month. Ooh. I don't, don't think that's good on the body consistently, but you know, I think I was able to do this because of my consistent hundred, 150 mile months that I've been putting in all year. Um, so I want to always have that foundation. And I always say this, right? Like, a guy like Nick Bear, who a good buddy of mine, who I, I look up to in many ways, like he can do everything, right? He can do an Ironman. He can fucking lift like no other. He can run a marathon. He's probably going to run a sub three. Um, so he can do all this stuff. He was an army ranger and everything. So I always want to have the foundation to be ready that if I need to train for something in a short period of time like this for six weeks, I can do it. And I think that's really important for me as a person, as an athlete, as a parent also, but I want people to also know that you don't want to have to always get ready. You want to always be ready because you don't know what life is going to throw at you. So again, using a fitness experience and using training to implement that in life is really important. So, you know, after my 50 next Saturday, yeah, I'm going to probably take a couple of days off of running just because I'm going to be probably a little sore um, and a little over it at that time. But within that week, I'm going to start running again. And like it's running just doesn't stop. And there's, I always like, you know, talking to David and, and hearing all these things, like there's no end in sight with this stuff, right? There's, there's no ending. This is now just the beginning of something new. You know, I might do rim to rim with the 10,000 guys. Like I'm, cool. I know I could do it now. So um, I'm excited to take on new challenges. You know, my, I want to get back into doing some Ironman stuff, even though I hate swimming and biking, but like, I would like to, to do that. Um, I'm looking forward to honestly putting back on some muscle and, and lifting heavy again and, and, and getting that physique that I always like because um, it does help with business a bit more. <laughs> so, you know, like I, I just want to um, continue to be an athlete, continue to grow, continue to challenge myself. Um, you never know. I might do a hundred miler. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll do that one day. Well, you let us know. We'll be there. We'll be out there with our, our chest painted for you. There we go. You know, <laughs> holding up the pom-poms. <laughs> No, I, yeah. 
Well, we're, we're almost at an hour, Brian, and I think that this is a, a pretty good place to, to wrap everything up. Uh, you know, personally, I want to thank you for coming on, uh, you know, having never met you before. It seems like, you know, you're doing some tremendous things, not only for yourself and your family, but, you know, for those of you, uh, those people in your community who, who really do need help and, and might not have an outlet to get it. Uh, and it's, it's always tremendous to be able to see people that are doing those things. Uh, we try to do as much of that outreach as we can here in Miami. So it's great to see when people in other parts of the country are doing the same thing and, and really doing their part as best they can to, to make that impact in other people's lives. So, you know, kudos to you for being able to do that. But I know Anthony's got a couple of rapid fire questions he wants to ask you at the end here. So get ready for that. But before he does that, where can people find you? How can they reach out to you? What are some of the best ways to do that? The best way is probably through Instagram. Um, unfortunately, I'm glued to it. So uh, that's probably the best way. Just at Brian Mez in my name and shoot me a DM, comment on a photo, and I'll probably get back to you and start some dialogue there. And hopefully you have the same interests where, you know, you never know. We might be at a race one day. We might be able to cross paths one day. And then once we're able to do HPLT again, I'm, I'm really curious and, and, and to see who has been taking care of themselves and wants to get back into training like that and, and just bettering themselves um, at any opportunity that comes their way. Well, Brian, I got to say again, we, we really thank you for coming on here, you know, and having connected with you in person yeah. and seeing the amazing things you do. You know, you definitely are an influence in my life and really look up to what you do and, and the way you do it. And just want to say thank you because I know a lot of our listeners are going to get a lot of value to the, out of this today. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hit you with some of these questions and let's get them rumbling. All right. Number one, since I know you, you were a soccer player athlete before, what was the biggest play that you ever had in your career? Um, it was on Halloween, my junior year, um, my sophomore year, we were playing St. Joe's. Um, our team was at like a, maybe a little bit over a 500 record and we had to win this final game in order to make it to the A-10 tournament. Um, I got the ball. Uh, we had this little Bolivian kid, Emerson, in the middle who was super phenomenal. And I remember, like, it was crazy. We were down one nothing, and I was talking to my homie who played right back, and I was playing right midfield. I was like, yo, what are we doing for Halloween tonight? Because it was, like, 10 seconds left, and we were, the ball was, like, all over the place. I say that to him, and then I see Emerson out of the corner of my eye get the ball, and I just, you know, I'm fast, so I just started running up the field. And he used to call me Mazzino and he was like, yo, Mazzino. And he hit like a fucking bullet at me. And I remember taking the ball down. It was like seven, six. I get past some dudes. I'm at the top of the box, five, four. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to fucking rip it. And I just yes. hit upper 90, dude. And it was like two, one, right in the corner of the net. And we tied to go into overtime. And then our dude, Eric, scored the game winner. And then we made it to the A-10s. And then we won the A-10 finals. So um, and then I was like, I, you know, what I said to my boy, I was like, what are we doing for Halloween? Yeah. yeah. It's a good way to wrap it up. Yeah. And I was so hung over the next day. Gotta celebrate that my, one. Coach, my coach knew that I was so lit because I stunk like goose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's no hiding from that were, in college. They were just like, we know what you guys did last night. Like, let's take it easy. We, we got the tournament, um, next week. Yeah, that's great. You got the highlight reel on that? I do. And I remember Woo! my best friend, um, Peter, who um, still my, my best homie and the godfather of my son, he was hurt. Um, and I scored and I slid into him and he just had knee surgery. And I oh, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> it was like, oh, no, it was, it was crazy. I do have the tape because my parents came to every game and they filmed it. Oh, that's it awesome, best, man. Well, we definitely, I would love to see a clip. Yeah, of you got to put that up social. on YouTube. I so I think my dad for Christmas is actually putting all the highlights together for me oh, on a USB. Awesome. Oh, nice. Great. Badass. Question number two. I know you love running, but if you had to pick a fitness tool, what would it be the only one you can choose? That gets the job done? A salt Free. bike. Boom. Ugh. Beast. Oh, that's <laughs> brutal. That's brutal. I remember the first time I did the 50 calorie challenge. I couldn't walk for like 20 minutes. <laughs> Like, I this summer I did uh, my knees. You know, I did this summer, which is why I did 500 calories, 10,000 row, uh, 10,000 meter animal. Yo, you are such a savage, animal. bro. Animal. I was, I was <laughs> Question number three What's the funniest experience you've had with your kids? My God, dude, when, when Leo first got a boner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I was like, he's like, what? What is that? Who like, did he see, or what was he watching? Get used to that, son. <laughs> Get used to that. You're like, gonna be around uh, for a long time, hopefully. I'm like, you're good, dude. Don't worry about yeah, it. You're yeah, good. You're good. You're you're good. good. <laughs> tuck it up. I'm like, yes, it works. Yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just tuck it up. It's okay. You'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's great. Fun. That's hilarious. Uh, next question. What's the craziest and wildest experience you ever had in your career as a whole, as a person? Oh, really crazy. So um, when I had the Ainsworth, we used to do a really sick um, NFL draft party. And um, we'd have like all the athletes would come, all the athletes, because it was in New York a lot before they started having it elsewhere. So we'd have all the guys come. Um, that's when Michael Vick first came, when he first got picked up by the Jets, I think after he oh, got out of prison or whatever. So he came, it was like Plaxico Burris was there, uh, Sean McCoy, all those dudes were there. And a couple drunk dudes, um, this guy's dog was like dying at home, right? Like, and he was lit. So he started to get lippy with Michael Vick and was like saying all this crazy shit to him. And Sean McCoy heard what was going on in Plaxico. It was like now getting to a, a scene where he's screaming blah, 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 blah at Michael Vick. And now the bouncers tried to escort this guy out. He started to fight with the bouncers and he wasn't a little dude. So he kind of like maneuvered around the bouncers and was able to kind of get to Michael Vick and this is like Michael Vick's first, it's on, it's on TMZ, if you'll see it. So we get them out, they are all out of the, uh, the restaurant and everyone's like fighting and, and everything. And I vividly remember, and I think you see this on TMZ, I kind of like grabbed Michael Vick's like bicep because I'm like trying to move him out of the way. And my man hit me with like a flex. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude's a rock, bro. And yeah. I was like, you're good. Like, you know what? <laughs> Everyone, you guys can kill each other. I'm going inside. I, I just remember, safe. I remember being a kid and going to see, you know, going to see him play against Syracuse when he was with Virginia Tech, just torching us, just shredding us up and down the field, just crying, knowing that he could have came and played for us and decided not to. And you know, people need to put him 70. in the, people need to put him in the conversation as one of the best athletes. They have to. Oh, he's incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. He, and, and not for anything, but that was the, the best Madden game. It was a cheat. Vick, no, that was a that the was best Madden cover. You couldn't be if he scram if he scrambled out of the pocket and you could, oh he just dump it off. That's what my cousin used to do, play with Michael Vick, just dump it off. Or if you went and, and try to take the receiver, he'd just Dunk. take it up the field. It's Dunk. like there's no beating you. No. Oh. Say gotta love Michael Vick. Last question, brother. What's the biggest piece of advice you can leave off to all our listeners today in one sentence? If it's not working, you gotta change it. You have to change it. Um and that's where I got nothing changes if nothing changes. So you're going to, if you continue to, you can, there's, there's two things, right? Consistency doesn't just mean it's good. So you can be consistent at doing stupid, bad shit 24 seven, and it's going to continue to make you stupid and, and do bad shit. So you have to change it up. Be consistent with positive stuff, be consistent with positive routine and positive habits, and you will only be able to grow. Guys, you heard it from Brian Maz himself. Brother, really appreciate you, man. Yes, thank you for coming on, man. All right, bro. Happy we were able to do this and figure out a good time. Um, it's been a crazy year. Thank you guys for putting out a great podcast. Thank you guys for great content all the time. Keep doing your thing and uh, have a great holiday. Awesome. Brother, you tune into the family. Money blessings. Yeah, same here. All right, until next right, time, guys. everybody. Bye.